I am going to relate some aspects of the precautionary principle as it applies to Schwellenberg as an as a emerging disease. And I'm also going to talk about how some things that are inherent in the precautionary principle have to be reconciled against what's inherent in APHIS's missions as an agency. We're going to talk um, some of the specifics about the virus and the syndrome itself. And um, in the process, I'll be giving you essentially what the European Union's position is and has been regarding their, their approach to Schwellenberg. And then we'll talk about what APHIS's position has been as well. And um, I'll be doing that kind of in a context of, of what is at stake for all of this as well. Well, <clears throat> just following up on what Mark Walton discussed um, very eloquently, I thought, in his opening talk today, the precautionary principle is a lot of different things. There's no single definition, but in a perfect situation, a perfect iteration of the precautionary principle, it's supposed to reflect what I have on that first bullet to indicate knowing what you know, not knowing what you think you know, knowing what you don't know, and not knowing what you don't know. If you've covered those four areas of knowledge, you've got everything in hand. And the precautionary principle originally was designed to reflect the risks associated with those factors. However, the next three or four bullets indicate really what the precautionary principle has become over time in the hands of some people that implement it for, for various purposes. So, as, doc, as Dr. Walton mentioned this morning, <laughs> some people think, better safe than sorry, the, the old adage of the, the humans, physicians, community, first do no harm, the absence of evidence is not a, evidence of essence, one of my favorite pathological um, statements. And then trying to, to prove the negative. These are all part and parcel of what the precautionary principle has become in fact over time. So in the italic bullet there, I summarized what Mark Walton actually referred to this morning in terms of the burden of proof for people who are either taking or not taking any particular action, and <clears throat> whose job it is to justify what. <clears throat> the, the problem with trying to summarize the precautionary principle in any way is that there is not necessarily going to be a consensus between anybody or among any groups regarding what, how, how is the word suspect or suspected defined? How do you define risk? How do you define harm? How do you even define the science? The, these are words and they're concepts, and it's very difficult to come to agreement on that. So you can have a zero risk approach for something that doesn't work very well in today's fast paced business environment, globally speaking, and locally speaking. So if you're not gonna have a zero risk tolerance, then what is the appropriate level of risk? Well, I'm providing all of this as kind of background for the rest of what we're going to talk about. Now, APHIS, on the other hand, we have missions as well. And our primary one is protecting American agriculture while facilitating trade. And I inserted safe in there because that's understood that trade needs to be safe. In order to do that, we're going to either retain or get new or expand the, the market access that we have for our own imports and our own exports, um, as well as those from other countries. And then, most importantly, we're trying to prevent the introduction of dangerous or foreign animal diseases. Now, if they do manage to come in despite our efforts, we do have other strategies in mind. Dr. Leiner just explained the FMD strategy. You can apply that to Schmallenberg as well, or any disease we don't have and don't want. So we can mitigate after something's here, or we can try to eradicate it, get back to normal. But if we can't prevent it, then we'd like to prevent it. We can not prevent it by not allowing any trade at all, but again, that is not our position. And importantly, our domestic animal population health status and our export health status are inextricably linked. So if we accidentally bring something in that we could have prevented, the people who will supply the rest of the world with our beef and live animals are going to suffer some consequences as a result of Schmallenberg was first um, isolated as a virus in the Schmallenberg area in Germany. It's a segmented, enveloped, single-strand RNA virus that's in the ortho virus genus. 
is in the Simbo Sarah group, which also has Ino and Akabani viruses. Um, it's kind of genetically most closely related to the Douglas and South Perry viruses. And it causes um, a manifestation of the arthrogryposis hygranencephaly syndrome, which is common to smaller remnants, but not limited to them. Who's affected? Well, many types of ruminants. In fact, at this point, I think we can assume that almost all species of ruminants could, in fact, be infected or become diseased with Schmallenberg syndrome. <coughs> so, uh, importantly, that would include bovines, but also sheep and goats, and other types of ruminants that are raised for farm purposes, and lots of wild types as well. Um, there have been serological evidence from equines and from uh, porcines, even canines. There have been you know, some reports in the literature of <coughs> true infection in dogs. It is not a human disease, at least not to anybody's knowledge to date, so it's not zoonotic. Nonetheless, farmers and even we as regulators are very much affected by this strange disease. Where did it come from? Where is it now? Well, we don't actually know where it came from. It may just have been a de novo virus that popped up. Something happened in terms of the susceptible host, the facilitative environment, and the virulent pathogen effect to create just the right conditions for this thing to show up. Right now, it's in 22 different European countries that have reported it. It's probably even more widespread than that. <coughs> Um, and tens of thousands of farms have been affected by the syndrome since it first showed up several years ago. Most importantly, it is not in North America, to our knowledge, and um, we would know it if it were here. When did it first show up? Well, the first reported cases were in the late, in late summer of 2011 and continuing into the fall of that year, um, centering around that area of Germany that I explained lent its name to the, the virus. And <clears throat> since 2011, as you can see with the different colors, they don't really show up that well on, on this version, but the, the kind of greenish, yellowish color represents where it was first, then the, the, the more green colors indicate where it spread to, and then the maroon on the screen indicates where it, where it migrated to. So over time, it's kind of steadily migrated north and east and now affects the majority of, of Europe. Um, the next slide actually shows Schmalberg on the left and Blue Tongue over the past decade um, as different serotypes um, have moved about Europe. And while not completely superimposable, it's very similar in terms of where this virus has gone compared to Blue Tongue. Why is that? Well, because of viruses are transmitted by Kilocoides midges. There may be mosquito transmission as well. That has not been ruled out. It proposed, or they were approved it. There could be some other insects involved. Um, there's a certain amount of viral incubation and replication that has to go on in either the host or the vector or both in order for successful transmission to occur. But the salient points for our discussion here include the fact that virus, infected virus, is actually shed in ruminant semen. And it's also um, capable of being transmitted transplacentally from infected dams. So those are two very important transmission uh, processes and representative of a truly vertically uh, connected syndrome. Keeping up with the, the how aspects, um, there probably are wildlife reservoirs involved. We know, based on the last three years of data, that you know, in association with global warming and lots of other um, observed effects, that the vectors, the midges, um, are certainly capable of being in different places to a, a greater extent currently than they used to be in the past, and um, that that has affected the way that this virus may have been able to pass from one year to the next, um, either in its current serotype iteration or as it continues to evolve as a virus. Um, there could be some role in terms of the way fomites, equipment, and various other uh, tissues may be involved in transmission, and then some other pathways that nobody's even thought of. Um, the, the virus has continued to evolve over time, and um, by now, three years after the first uh, reported introduction, 
there have been reinfections in some farms, um, in some cases, with slightly differing serotypes. <clears throat> so I think we can expect more of that in the future to be um, found in Europe. In terms of um, isolating this virus uh, by diagnostic assays, the types of tissues I've listed here, um, certainly blood and semen, provide very uh, useful samples for finding virus from infected animals. And then, you know, depending on the um, infections in fetuses or in dams, there can be other diagnostic materials used as well. And those um, samples contain viable RNA for several weeks after um, initial infection. What kind of assays are, are used, or how how is Schmallenberg actually detected? Well, you know when you see it, that's for sure, but it's not <coughs> problematic in terms of the types of, of um, stillbirths or abortions or AHS that, that can occur. Those are, are capable of being caused by many different causes. Um, it can be cultured. Uh, there are various serological tests, including um, serum neutralization and um, IFA, ELISAs. There are PCRs, although uh, the PCR that's currently used is validated only for, for blood and is not validated for use in semen. That would be very useful if there were a, a good, dependable assay by PCR for semen. There isn't right now. Um, and there's real-time RT-PCR as well. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, we try to get serum or whole blood samples when there are some indications to, to sample animals, um, such as fever or drop in production or, or diarrhea of various types. <clears throat> it's an envelope virus, so it doesn't really hold up all that well outside the, the host. Um, it's affected by temperature, various chemicals and disinfectants, fairly easy to kill this thing. Um, and most of this information has not been developed specifically for uh, Schmalberg virus, but it's extrapolated from the genus in which it's one member. So how's disease caused? Well, um, this has been extensively studied in bovines, particularly in cattle. Um, to a lesser extent, it's been studied in sheep and goats on an experimental level, but much of the disease information for smaller rodents is more anecdotal in nature. But you can say for sure that the incubation period for most ruminants is, is fairly short, one to four days, and a correspondingly short period of viremia. No more than five days, six days max. Um, at which point the viremia is passed and it moves on to the next phase. There's an antibody response, it's usually fairly strong. The average time to seroconversion is somewhere between two and four weeks after infection. For many types of ruminants, there could be up to 100% morbidity. It's a quick-moving virus. Um, usually whole farms are affected and not just parts of farms. The mortality is fairly low. Maybe 1% of the animals that are infected die of this in, adult, in adults. And for those adult animals that um, are not pregnant, there's a transient and relatively brief period of time when they don't eat as much, they may run fever, they get diarrhea. And for dairy animals, there's going to be a fairly substantial drop in milk production. And I think the 50% figure is fairly representative of what a number of farms in Europe have experienced, both for bovines and bovine and caprine dairy animals. Now, for animals that are pregnant, this is where it becomes much more of a problem because <clears throat> over the expected level of stillbirths or birth defects in general, most farms can expect to see about a 4% increase in those types of defects. For bovines, the critical period of infectivity is between 140 and 150 days of gestation, and for sheep and goats, generally between 20 and 80 days of gestation. What results are things like I've described under the abortions and stillbirths category. There's lots of OCs there. There's lots of cephalies there. But in the end, <coughs> um, the offspring that are coming out of infected animals are uh, not the kind that farmers want to see. Well, you don't have to just sit there and watch a train coming and carry. There are ways to prevent Schmalmann 
infection. However, once something's been infected and diseased, there's no treatment basically other than support it. So you could, if you wanted to, locate your breeding animals into non-vector areas. You could try to resynchronize your breeding. You can vector through your existing facilities. You can test and remove various um, important breeding animals. But again, you can expect just about 100% morbidity, so you have to act fast. You can deliberately expose some animals to Schwanberg and then assume that they'll have lifelong immunity. Unfortunately, we really don't know that to be the case for all the different species that are capable of infection. And we also don't know whether the, the newly developing serotypes are going to be protected by previous infection. We think so, not really sure. Um, may get some passive immunity by feeding colostrum. But if you're also going to be vaccinating, there is a vaccine available, at least one in Europe. Um, it requires for cattle two doses given about four weeks apart, for sheep <coughs> dose, generally one dose that's given um, before the breeding season starts. But the cost can be fairly substantial, up to $10 a head if you're given two doses, about $5 a dose right now. And the overall efficacy, the jury's still out on that. I'm not really sure. It's a kill vaccine, so you know, it's going to be very important levels of protection. Um, in, in terms of feeding colostrum to naive animals. <clears throat> it, it may actually uh, be interfered with by the, the uh, stimula antibody stimulation that you get from vaccines. And then lastly, you can try to breed genetically resistant animals. I think that might be something to look into in the future for Europe, but right now it's not. <coughs> well, to their credit, um, the countries in Europe that follow the European guidelines established by the European Commission have engaged in a lot of research involving the Friedrich Leffel, Leffler Institute in Germany. It's one of the reference laboratories there for um, uh, ortho bunya viruses, and particularly for Schmallenberg. Um, the European Food Safety Agency has devoted a lot of time and resources to filing reports about Schmallenberg. They've looked at the economic and other types of impacts associated with outbreaks. They developed um, a fairly extensive web capacity to provide updated information. And um, they have relied, in part, contributed to and relied on the technical fact sheets that the World Organization for Animal Health has also developed for Schmallenberg um, virus. <clears throat> but I think it's safe to say, in terms of having taken actions or not taken actions, we can say that the EU has not really dealt with Schmallenberg as an emerging disease. They're, they are dealing with it as an already emerged disease, and they have already decided that it's not of terrible consequence in terms of their oversight and their regulations. So they've not applied any specific trade restrictions. It's not a reportable um, virus or disease. None, nonetheless, some individual member states may have developed their own uh, differing risk tolerance, and they require things like donor testing and certification for movement into their countries if they're not affected by Schmallenberg. <clears throat> um, the commission does not consider that either live animals or any of their products, including senior embryos, cause <coughs> of transmission. Well, I, I don't think that they're actually considering that they don't pose a risk of transmission. They're advocating that we need not be concerned with those as a risk of transmission. And they also feel very strongly that any actions that have been taken by their trading partners, importantly including the United States, um, have not been justified and continue to be unjustified in terms of these risks. In, in retrospect, they've actually applied the same attitude towards Lino and Alcabani viruses, even the blue tongue to some extent, because none of those are also reportable or, or uh, necessitating testing or certifications in order for animals to, to move into or through the as I mentioned before, they have contributed um, throughout Europe to the, the technical fact sheets and the EFSA um, impact studies that support their conclusions. So it's a kind of tightly interwoven uh, perspective that Europe has about Schmalberg. But what's at stake? They, you know, they're almost equivalent to the you know, total of the United States in terms of domestic bovine cattle populations. They've got about 115 million head. <clears throat> they don't import very many at all from non-EU countries, and they don't export very many either, about half a million a year to non-EU countries. In terms of sheep and goats, well, they have a much larger um, sheep and goat uh, 
industry there than in the United States with about over 100 million combined. They do export um, roughly 2 million sheep a year to non-EU countries, a fairly important export market for them. They don't import any new ones, though. And overall, I think you can look at the, the ruminant industry's value in Europe as being well over $100 billion, very similar to the United States. They've been very um, cagey about providing economic loss numbers, but again, because they've concluded that roughly 4% is an acceptable figure to throw around, that <clears throat> an impact is relatively insignificant. Um, we don't necessarily agree with that conclusion or even the assessment. So now I'll talk about how APIS has responded to Schmallenberg, um, not only in terms of what we might do, but what the European Union is doing as a whole. It's a foreign animal disease as far as we're concerned. We don't have it, we don't want it, we can keep it out. Um, and we have kept it out today. So I can stop the talk here. We've been very successful. <laughs> but whether we've been successful because of what we've done or in spite of what we've done, that's for discussion. We do consider it still to be a significant emerging disease. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, our Canadian counterparts feel very similar to the way that APHIS does. On the other hand, Mexico, to my knowledge, really has no import requirements that are specific to Schmallenberg. So there's a little bit of a disconnect throughout North America. But the bottom line is that, and this kind of fits in with what I was saying before about knowing what you know and not really knowing what you know. There still are questions that we have not yet answered to our own satisfaction regarding the transmission risk <coughs> for this virus. And until and unless we get some additional information about that and assess it, we feel that our position that we've taken today has been fairly well justified. So what have we done today? Well, the people in Fort Collins at the Centers for Epidemiology and Animal Health have done very um, professional pathways analyses for this. And um, we identified the capacity in the United States to have vectors that would be similar to those like C. obsoletus, Cumulocoides uh, obsoletus, or, or the Wolfie that existed in Europe. <laughs> in, in all likelihood, if this virus were to be introduced to the U.S., there probably would be competent vectors capable of moving it about. We've provided case definitions. Um, there's been some small level of uh, passive surveillance and maybe some additional active observational surveillance that helps assure ourselves that it's not here in the United States currently. We've provided some fact sheets, we've had various industry discussions and done some outreach, including this kind of presentation. We've certainly um, had collaborations through NBSL and other um, laboratories in the U.S. with the research institutes in Europe that have a lot of experience <coughs> by now with um, sampling and testing and, and validating. Um, <coughs> we, sort of in total, have provided ourselves with the modified um, risk assessment by carefully reviewing and discussing all of the available information, all of the scientific and all of the trade data that we can, can get our hands on. We've also talked to Canada in particular, as well as um, other trading partners, Australia, New Zealand, regarding their perspectives for this um, syndrome and how trade has been affected in their regions as well. And <coughs> yeah, most importantly, and uh, to the European Commission's uh, great dissatisfaction, we have instituted a number of proactive import restrictions for the materials that are capable of, of vectoring this virus to us, namely semen and embryos. So back in 2012, in March, just about two years ago now, <coughs> we put out our first import alert um, and limited the ability of bovine semen and embryos to have been collected prior to June 1st, 2011, which we had uh, assigned as the, the first date that uh, that virus actually showed up in Europe. So we applied that to the EU countries as well as any countries that are following EU legislation. Uh, originally, we included Iceland. We backed off on that relatively quickly. They don't have the right vectors. They don't import anything. They're not really part of the EU. <coughs> then in October of 2012, we utilized the best available information that we 
um, have evaluated carefully and allowed <coughs> for testing and certification of bovine semen and bovine embryo donors. So we made a, a vision to our import alert allowing for donors to be eligible if they were tested twice by a serum neutralization assay using a one-day cutoff. And that test had to be done within 30 days before collection, with the second test being 28 to 60 days after collection. We did make allowance in that revision for serologically positive donors that were in part of a resident herd somewhere to be tested again by PCR and various other um, assays within a certain timeline, um, and then would accept their negativity as a result of that. However, right after we did that, some additional information came out that made us rethink what we thought we knew. And when we looked at the additional information, we <clears throat> concluded that at this time, we're really not prepared to let any seropositive bovines be eligible as donors. And that has been our position to date. Now, starting early in this year, we began a systematic review following international guidelines for how systematic reviews are to be conducted um, that we're expecting to be completed in the next couple of months, I would say within the next two months, and to come up with a report that will reflect all of the available validated scientific information in order to help us determine exactly what our appropriate level of risk tolerance should be for imports of not only bovine semen and embryos, but bovine and caprine semen and embryos, as well as live animals, which now that we've recently changed our rules for uh, BSE, have allowed the potential eligibility of, of some of those to be imported to the US as well. As of right now, sorry to say, bovine and caprine semen still not eligible for importation, in part, um, <coughs> because we're waiting for this comprehensive systematic review. <coughs> What's at stake for us? Well, we've got over 75,000 sheep farms, 138,000 goat farms. We've got a fairly substantial population, nowhere near what Europe does. Um, our imports and exports are much smaller. We only import or export fewer than 10,000 live sheep or goats a year. But nonetheless, the market value for that industry is probably greater than $5 million. And certainly, our domestic market value is half a billion dollars. For cattle, proportionally greater in every respect, we have a huge bovine industry. We, even though we have the smallest domestic herd right now since the 50s, we still have close to 100 million. We import roughly 2 million cattle a year, mainly from uh, Mexico and, and Canada. We export about 100,000 live animals a year. And we have a fairly substantial uh, germplasm import and export industry valued at close to $4 billion. When you put all those things together um, <clears throat> and, and look at our domestic market value of probably a combined $100 billion, you're talking about a lot of money. How do our other stakeholders feel about what we've been doing? Well, we can't please everybody all the time. We certainly can upset everybody at any given time. <laughs> but we have um, had encouraging support from our own industry in the US. We know for a fact that <clears throat> the way that the European Commission has interpreted their own market data um, is, is really different from the reality of what's going on in countries like the UK and even the Netherlands and Germany. The, the effects on individual farmers can be catastrophic, and they have been catastrophic. We're talking about 20 to 50% birth defects in sheep and goats, not 4% as the Commission had originally averaged everything together for cattle and sheep. The, <clears throat> so what the theory and the facts say about Schwellenberg can be quite different. As a result, our ruminant producers have generally been supportive of what we have done to date. That would certainly be cattle as well as sheep and goats. And the people involved in germplasm imports and exports have also been fairly supportive. Everybody accepts our um, interpretation of the available information that we have had. Uh, the European Commission has not been supportive. In fact, has taken every opportunity to be critical of our um, restrictions and has insisted that we remove any and all requirements for Schmollenberg 
or they basically don't want to keep talking about other approaches. Nonetheless, that's their official position. In reality, we can and have had discussions, bilateral discussions, with individual countries within the EU, and we've come to some workarounds, at least in terms of the bovine semen and embryos. Um, so trade has not been completely restricted for those commodities. Uh, ovine and caprine are a little bit different at this time. Is one approach right versus another being wrong? Are we right? Is the European Commission wrong? I cannot answer that. I think we do need to keep in mind what Mark Alton said this morning about the ways in which the precautionary principle have applied. The European Union is accusing us of being overly precautionary. In fact, they're thinking that we have used the precautionary principle and we should not be using it. That's quite different from our normal perspective about the precautionary principle. And again, as I said, you know, our, we're looking to our systematic review, which is close to completion, to help clarify what those true level of risks should be.